You're watching Non-Stop Local Special Edition. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you and yours. My name is John Martin and my goodness gracious, I am so excited. In this next half hour, we're gonna take a journey across the treasure state to explore some of the people, the places and the things that make Montana so unique and so wonderful. We'll take a drive east to Terry, Montana to explore the historic Kempton Hotel before driving to Hardin to hang out with Pearl Jam bass player Jeff Amon as he opens another skate park in the Treasure State. Then, of course, Fort Benton to talk about Forever Faithful, the story of Shep. But before that, let's just head about 20 minutes east of us right here in Billings to Huntley to learn about the Huntley Irrigation Project. And if you don't know, this is a project that truly helped form the entirety of this region and to make it what it is today. Just about 12 miles east of Billings sits a stretch of land that runs 27 miles by four miles where ranchers and farmers not only help feed Montana, Wyoming and a good portion of the United States, but also a good portion of the world. None of this feasible though, without a remarkable feat of engineering that occurred right here in the early 1900s called the Huntley Irrigation Project. It's amazing. Uh, I can't even fathom what they had to plan and what they had to do to make sure it all flowed well and, and that pumping station worked properly and everybody got their water. The Huntley Irrigation Project was made possible through the Reclamation Act of 1902. The United States was growing and the government realized that they needed dedicated land to grow crops so they could feed the booming population. The land here was surveyed for suitability and purchased from the Crow Tribe for around $1.2 million in 1905. A trip to the Huntley Project Museum today highlights the incredible efforts it took to get water from the Yellowstone River to those sagebrush fields. And it was basically all hand dug um, using mules and horses and man digging it out with scrapers and Fresnos. 32 miles of main canal, 22 miles of carriage canal, 202 miles of laterals and on and on. This was a true effort of man taming and cultivating the wild. The project was completed in 1907 and the land was opened up to homesteading through a lottery system. But what did it take to become one of those first homesteaders to settle here? A self-starter and a pioneer. And so it's pretty amazing um, to come out here and come out to these dry sagebrush, short grass prairie fields and start clearing them and burning off the sagebrush and greasewood and, and thinking, oh, I wanna have water and be able to plant and grow stuff here in a couple of years. And, and they did and it's, um, it was a tough, <laughs> tough road to hoe. <laughs> More than 100 years later, some of those same families continue to raise livestock and prep their fields. The principal crops now being grown, alfalfa, hay crops, sugar beets, corn, wheat, and barley. We have the Coors Elevator right next to us. That, that's a major contributor to our economy and our, our valley now. Just a little time visiting out here can help you understand and appreciate the resiliency, the dedication, and the significance of what these farmers and ranchers do on a daily basis. Your butter and your milk and your food doesn't come from the store directly. You have It has to be grown, it has to be processed, it has to be shipped, and it has to go to your grocery store. It's not, uh, there's a lot of steps between what you uh, get on your dinner table and what it starts out as. Absolutely wonderful people at the Huntley Irrigation Project Museum. I'm never going to tell you how to live your life, but if I was going to make plans for you, I would definitely send you there at least once because you're going to learn so much about the history of our area. All right, let's take a drive to Terry, Montana to check out the world famous and very historic Kempton Hotel. Welcome to Terry, Montana, home of the Kempton Hotel the oldest continuously operated hotel in the state of Montana. 43,852 days today. So you were here 43,852 days after our first guest was served. For more than 120 years, the Kempton Hotel has been the heartbeat of the Terry community. In fact, it's a true part of the area's history. Hotels built in 1902. 1902, Theodore Roosevelt's president. He's a personal friend of James Bernie Kempton. They've 
they worked together. Their, the ranches were 85 miles apart. Um, Pierre Weibo, uh, the Eaton uh, out of North Dakota. Th these were true pioneers. And James was part of that group. James had several children, including one who could be considered a prodigal son. One of the boys was Bernie Kempton. He ran off and joined the Well West Show. So he didn't want to be in Terry. And he went all over the world with Colonel Carver. So he comes back and he takes over the hotel with his wife, Martha. He was an entertainer and he understood what it took to entertain. So he was the front man for the hotel. Martha was the brains, she worked in, in behind the scene. The restaurant was amazing restaurant. Well, after Bernie's death, Martha maintained the Kempton before finally selling it after 54 years of family ownership. The deed changed hands for several years, no one really honoring it the way the community would have hoped until the Schwartz purchased it in the late 1980s. When we bought this, we had no idea that our entire retirement and our life was gonna get tied up into keeping this place open. And as I did more and more research, realized how special the place was, not just because of who stayed here, um, but found out what the hotel did for the community. Russell and his wife, Linda, maintained the Kempton because they truly believe the area needs it today, even more so than when it was built more than a century ago. You can explore local artwork here. You can peruse the library and just enjoy the Kempton's slower pace. But when you're here, relax, because this place allows you to go to the museum, go to the Evelyn Cameron Gallery, go to over to Prairie Unique and look at the Made in Montana and all the unique stuff he has over there, you know. Go across the street to the Roy Rogers, have a beer and a pizza and a hamburger. You can relax here without, it, on your feet. You don't have to drive across town. And what's refreshing, Russell explains, they're not trying to make this hotel anything that it's not already. We're a 120 year old hotel that has its flaws, you know. Old people have wrinkles, old hotels have wrinkles. And, and we expose them, you can see them. We don't make up, cover them. It is what it is. You come to the hotel, understand your living history. You're part of it. The Kempton Hotel is an absolute jewel of Eastern Montana. All right, after the break, we head to Hardin to hang out with Montana native and Pearl Jam bass player, Jeff Amon, as he opens another skate park. Everybody, Merry Christmas to you and yours. My name is John Martin, and let's have a hypothetical conversation, shall we? If you were going to put together the Mount Rushmore of Montanans, let's think about who would go up there. Well, Jeanette Rankin, of course, that's a no-brainer. But then you got people like Gary Cooper, Dana Carvey. But for my money, it is Montana native and Pearl Jam bass player Jeff Amon. If you don't know much about Jeff, in addition to being a, a rock and roll hall of famer over his career he has opened more than 30 skate parks across rural pacific northwest territory a lot of the areas that maybe feel underserved or overlooked well recently he opened another skate park in Hardin. <laughs> The fact that a skate park is bringing a community together is like, that's like pure gold. A remarkable day in Hardin, Montana for the opening of the city's newest amenity at Wilson Park, a world-class skate park. Three, two, one. Somebody make some noise. The project was headed up by these Hardin teens. And that one familiar face in the middle, Big Sandy native and Pearl Jam co-founder, Jeff Amen. I, I mean, I never really have expectations for this stuff, but you know, this morning I was like, yeah, man, there'll be a hundred people that'll be awesome, but it's, there's probably a hundred skateboarders here, probably at least a couple hundred community folks. Jeff's nonprofit, Montana Pool Service, has helped create more than 30 skate parks in rural communities across the Pacific Northwest. The purpose of the nonprofit is to help kids advance their education while providing safe areas to recreate, like this new skate park. You want it to be seen as a healthy, positive 
influence on the community and it just felt like that today. Everybody that I talked to is so grateful. And he talked to a lot. He spent the morning taking pictures, signing autographs, even stopping to take in the sounds of the Hardin High School cover band covering one of his own songs. The hope is that this new park will bring together both kids and adults from across the area like it has in so many of the other locations Jeff has visited before. You know, like there's, 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 there's friends between those communities and that, that was part of the idea of putting one in Lodgegrass and putting one in Hardin was just feeling like, wow, if you can get a, a smaller one in the smaller town, a little bit bigger one in Hardin, then it just sort of greases the community, you know, connection. I, can't, I just can't wait to come back the next few years and just see what's going on here. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, philanthropist, pretty good argument for the Mount Rushmore of Montanans. All right, after the break, we are talking all things Western hatware. You're watching Nonstop Local Special Edition. everybody merry christmas happy holidays to you and yours my name is john martin and one day i was walking out of the burger dive and i looked up and i and i saw a young woman about three stories up painting uh, on the side of a building and i thought well that's unique i should probably talk to her about that turns out her name is wiley and she was commissioned to paint that beautiful mural the bison mural on the side of jake's downtown well in addition to that she can bring her canvas down to do some really intricate work when it comes to wood burning or art on Western headwear. Now, the last time we spent time with Riley Zembrennan, she was several stories up in Billings painting a bison mural on the side of Jake's downtown. The whole experience really elevated my business for sure. Um, things really took off from there, so I'm thankful for that opportunity. A wonderful opportunity for exposure but a bit of a larger canvas than Riley was accustomed to. See, traditionally, she's a pyrographer. So I use a hot soldering tool, pretty much like drawing a picture. It's much different than a paintbrush, so it was a much different experience doing a mural, um, especially of that size. Her intricate work is a must-have for many across the Treasure State. Seeing her artwork, it's apparent that she's been honing her skills for years. Uh, painting's always been my thing and just drawing with a pencil. But when I was younger, uh, drawing with a pencil, I could never figure out how to make it look complete, I guess. It just looked like a sketch. So then that's when I went to paints. Uh, and then it wasn't until, you know, I said seven years ago that I picked up wood burning. And that's when I really found my craft. Her next chapter, or canvas, artistic interpretation on Western wear. More specifically, hats. I really didn't know what kind of hat you had to burn on. I just ordered an Amazon hat that was polyester and cotton and um, tried it. And I like doing it. It's really fun. <laughs> From an Amazon basic to a Stetson classic, Riley accents the headwear with the customer's specific request of Western landscape. The hats, you no, know, I just have to go for it and hope that it works out. Change my mistakes into something else. <laughs> murals, wood burning, hat art, elementary school art teacher. She has a lot on her plate, but what is Riley going to do next? How else can she surprise us? I don't know. I have a lot on my plate for the next year, but uh, <laughs> I just have a lot of different ideas to try on hats um, and lots of different wood burning ideas that are just in my head that I'm excited to get out. <laughs> and of course, if you'd like to hire Riley for some hat wear artwork, Step number one, get a hat. Where are we going to do that? Well, there's a couple of places around town, but maybe before you make your final decision, check out the new custom hat manufacturer on Broadway in downtown Billings. I love hats because they tell your story. Uh, they have that unique ability to tell you something about somebody without saying a word. Um, Hats are one of those things that they're heirlooms, you know. You remember that hat that your grandfather wore, the hat that your grandmother wore. The love for a Western hat is as old as the American West itself. It was a necessity for settlers, farmers, and ranchers, anyone who dared tame the Great Plains. 
and is a tradition that Darren Hackey keeps alive in his downtown billing storefront. For me personally, uh, the experience of a custom hat uh, fitting was so special the first time I, I got to experience it in Texas. A Mayo Clinic graduate in physical therapy, Darren spent several years in bars and clubs, uh, picking his way into a career in music. When COVID hit, uh, I wasn't playing a lot of music and I needed a creative outlet and I love hats. And I uh, just asked myself, how do they make those? So YouTube was where he turned to first, only to find out. Uh, it's a very guarded trade. It's a historic trade that uh, secrets are not shared, uh, shared very often. So, um, so I just uh, decided that I would apprentice and uh, I've apprenticed with a couple hat makers of over with over 40 years of experience. But Darren wasn't going to settle for creating and manufacturing any sort of hat. If he was going to do this, he wanted to make sure that these were legacy hats. The quality uh, materials that we use are top of the line um, from the sweatbands to the felts that we, we use to make these. And then everything is done by hand. When you schedule your appointment, Darren sits you down, offers you a whiskey and talks about what look, feel and style works best for you continuing that experience he had at his first hat fitting, embracing the rich history of hat making, surrounded by the rich history of this Western town. It's a historic trade. Um, so we believed very strongly that we wanted to be downtown where there is more history. Um, it tells the story of hat making uh, a little better in my opinion, and uh, it just fits. Absolute artistry there on Broadway in downtown Billings. And how often do you get to set your clothes on fire before you wear them? That's a selling point. All right, after the break, we head to Fort Benton to tell the story about forever faithful Shep the dog. Welcome back, everybody. John Martin wishing you the, the merriest of Christmases, the happiest of holidays. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for watching this. And I hope you've enjoyed some of the stories about Montana and the people, the places, the things that make it so unique and so wonderful. This last story, uh, forever faithful Chef the dog at a Fort Benton, Montana. I mean, it, it, I, it broke me down several times. I got two wonderful dogs. Well, one wonderful dog at home. The other one, I tell people, uh, that he was raised by a Spanish speaking family. He's ESL and that's why he doesn't uh, listen to what I have to say to him. N nonetheless, I love him uh, and, and when you see this story, I hope it makes you appreciate whether it be your dog, your cat, your guinea pig, whatever it is, the love that your four legged friend has for you. Here's Shep the dog forever faithful. The story of Shep the dog could be considered a tragic one. But for many here in Fort Benton, Montana, it's a reminder of the power of love, compassion, and faithfulness. August of uh, 1936, you'd find that there was this sheep herder being brought into town, a man who was sick, and he was brought to St. Clair Hospital run by the uh, Catholic nuns, the Sisters of Providence, uh, and he remained there for a couple of days up until the point at which he died. And he was being trailed by this dark and, and, and white collie-like dog. That collie-like dog, Shep, never left the hospital grounds until his owner's body was prepared to be shipped back. His body is taken by coffin, by cart, up to the uh, train station and loaded onto a train, and the dog comes along. Shep watched with anxious eyes as the body of his master pulled away on that eastbound train. But back to the station he came, and he took up a home underneath the platform of the Fort Benton train station. And there, for the next five and a half years, the dog met every train coming into Fort Benton, searching out his master, who obviously is not gonna come back. Five and a half years, four passenger trains a day, works out to about 8,000 trains that Shep would meet awaiting the return of his owner. Sniffed all the passengers, smelled at the baggage cars, heard the conductor say all aboard, heard the train chug out of the station. What do you think that that dog thought as he saw that chain, as that train went by? You know what I think he thought? Maybe the next one. Several locals and those who read about this dog as they passed through tried to adopt Shep themselves. 
but he would again and again refuse to leave that station. But as the years passed, Shep grew both arthritic and hard of hearing. On January 12th of 1942, the dog, uh, when a train was chugging into the station, did not see or hear the train, slipped on the snowy rails, and you could say at that time he rejoined his master. But that is not the end of the story for Shep. Shep was buried on a mound overlooking the city of Fort Benton. Hundreds came for the service. His story of dedication was put into a pamphlet and sold to passengers on the rail line, raising funds for charitable needs even to this day. Just a few months ago, there was another celebration of Shep's life that was held up in Great Falls on the 80th anniversary of Shep's death. And at that, some of those pamphlets were sold and money was raised and once again provided to the Montana School for the Deaf and Blind. So this is a part of Shep that continues to live on far beyond his own life. Eight decades now, his story continues to touch the hearts of those who hear it. A remarkable story about the love that one dog had for his human. To think that there is this animal that so many of us love and that love us so much and have formed that sort of a bond that we just like to be reminded that we have fellow travelers here on earth who share this time with us. Old Shep, a very good boy who is forever faithful. And Fort Benton, Montana, such an absolutely wonderful place to visit. So much history, so much beauty, outdoor activity, uh, really some place to maybe pencil in places to visit in the year 2023. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful holiday season and the happiest of New Year's. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Truly hope you've enjoyed some of these stories, celebrating the people and the places and things that make our uh, corner of the world so unique and so wonderful. Always feel free to send me an idea, places I should go, people I should meet. I love to share their stories with you. Until next time, everyone, my name is John Martin. Be good to yourself and to others. In a one-horse open sleigh, o'er the fields we go. Love